So yes, fortunately, after I have pissed everyone off with my opinions about theology and ontology, we can uh, we can all have a beer. So you know, there there is that. Uh, always a good way to argue things is is uh, is over a beer. Are you dying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll might as well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just start rambling on here. I think the first little bit I have to say is not, uh, anyone who comes in late won't miss too much if I just start with this. Uh, so hello, thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Tom Swiss, and let me do a, uh, a moment of self-promotion. I am the author of Why Buddha Touched the Earth, and a, uh, a collection of essays called What Does It Mean for the Gods to Exist, which this talk grew out of, and you can buy a copy of that at the Ace Book Tent. Yes, you can help me get gas money home. And I blog at patheos.com as the Zen Pagan. And if you look in your, your Starwood tour guide there, um, you'll see that I describe my spiritual path as a Zen Pagan Taoist Atheist Discordian. Uh, sometimes I even throw Transcendentalist in there too, just to really mix it up. I've been calling myself both a Pagan and an Atheist since the 90s and when I first got into paganism uh, my real world community was a very eclectic bunch we had Christian pagans we had self-initiated Wiccans we had folks doing Druid stuff uh, you know I was throwing in some some Zen and Taoist stuff so who was gonna argue right you know we were not part of any large organization or, or even culture really beyond our own little network there in the DC suburbs and back in those days, um, back on those days online, this is before the web had really gotten started, but we had this thing called Usenet, which is where we used to spend all of our time arguing back in the day, and uh, email lists. And so this is long before Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, or even search engines like Google or even uh, AltaVista. Anybody? AltaVista? Nobody? Nobody? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. Um, so on these, these uh, news groups and mailing lists, they were more like just conversations that went on forever. They weren't static resources. There was no way to search them. And so in this, this culture, there kind of evolved a, a tradition, a standard, that news groups would post a frequently asked questions list, an FAQ. You may have seen that, uh, that word, that abbreviation, that acronym. I'm not quite sure what, what you would call. I had to look up, look that up when I get um, frequently asked questions with answers because just a list of questions would not really be useful. It was just to avoid the same points coming up over and over again. And someone wrote one for the, 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 the neo-paganism uh, discussion group. Now, online culture at that time was very tech heavy. The rest of y'all hadn't gotten on there. It was just us geeks and nerds. Um, I wrote my first HTML in 1993, so get off my lawn. And um, there was a really good frequently asked questions about neo-paganism written by Eric S. Raymond, who's a, a kind of a well-known guy in the hacker community, uh, free software movement, all that stuff. And he, his uh, frequently asked questions thing said, many neo-pagans are philosophical agnostics or even atheists. There's a tendency to regard the gods as Jungian archetypes or otherwise in some sense created by and dependent on human belief and thus naturally plural and observer dependent. Uh, uh, Raymond was, he was a Wiccan priest at one point. He was also uh, a Zen guy, so as the Zen pagan, I thought, oh, okay, yeah. got, some, uh, got some interesting point of view there. So if you're interested in that whole Zen paganism thing that I talk about sometimes, you might look up his spiritual autobiography, which is called uh, Dancing with the Gods. It's just an essay, it's not a book or anything. You can find it online. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Raymond, or ESR as we hackers call him, kind of went nuts after 9-11. Uh, went to serious, uh, wacky conspiracy theory bullshit, so there's that. But his older stuff about neo-paganism, some of the stuff he wrote, is, is pretty good, pretty useful. So nobody complained, is the point, about my pagan atheist identification back then. And uh, I've had that in my bio 15 or 20 years, uh, presenting at Free Spirit Gathering, at Starwood here, uh, on my blog, in my books. And the, uh, neither the pagan police nor the atheist agents have yet come to take me away. So you can do that. You can get away with it. You know, if you yourself are like, oh, yeah, I, paganism, this, this, this feels right, but 
I don't know if I actually believe with a capital B. Um, you don't have to, okay? Uh, so that's a point I would I would like to make. Um, we get into a whole thing about how paganism is more about practice than dogma, but we don't have so much time today. And in fact, there are enough of us out there who, who claim the label atheist pagans or sometimes uh, humanistic pagans or naturalist pagans or a couple other um, non-theistic pagans instead of atheist. Uh, a couple terms that, that we try to finally grade in exact right language. There's a, a collection called uh, Godless Paganism. came out two or three years ago and it's all essays. I've got uh, two pieces in there by people who claim those labels. So if this is interest to you, I I was going to bring my copy to show you and then life happened. But uh, you can you can easily find it in, in ebook or in Dead Trees version at your favorite local bookstore. Um, but a couple years ago, I went out to Pantheacon out on the West Coast, which is it's a little strange. It's the first time I had been to a pagan gathering that was in a hotel. I, I got to get clothes on. What? Where's the fire? Yes, it was, it was a different kind of energy. But um, out there, I met two pretty prominent guys in this uh, in this movement. Uh, Mark Green, who's uh, he, he kind of does his thing under the uh, atheopaganism banner, and John Halstead. He's the editor of that book that I mentioned, and uh, he blogs at huma humanisticpaganism.com. And I was I was kind of surprised at some of their stories about the hostility that they had encountered uh, about identifying as atheists and pagans. Now, um, you know, in fact, as a, a matter of historical fact, the intersection of atheism and neo-paganism goes way back to the start of the pagan revival. One of the roots of the neo-pagan revival was the romantics in uh, Britain, the romantic poets, okay? Percy Bryce Shelley, Keats, those guys. Um, Shelley, especially, was big into that. Now, he and his buddies weren't just using the deities as literary devices. They were trying to get beyond their culture's Christianity. They were looking for a new religious paradigm. And so Shelley, he wrote of the, uh, and I quote, Sacred Goddess, Mother Earth, thou from, whom immortal, th thou from whose immortal bosom gods and men and beasts have birth. And at least one time, he raised an altar to Pan, and he wrote about that as the true religion. But this dude was also an amateur scientist who got kicked out of Oxford for writing a book called The Necessity of Atheism. So it's right there at the start. You have this, this idea of the deities coming from people who also claim to be atheists. Uh, Shelley was also an anarchist and a vegetarian. I love this guy. Um, so atheism is, is right there at the start. But so, yeah, there does seem to have been kind of a backlash the past few years uh, uh, about this stuff. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, a bit of a backlash kind of corresponding to the rise of a group who, I, th I think the label that we, we've kind of come to call them are devotional polytheists. Okay. Um, devotional polytheists, they, they are explicitly they believe in supernaturalism, and they often insist that our gods are, are many and literal and real. And I think in some way that might be a reaction to some of the language that some of the naturalistic, humanistic, atheistic pagans have used where they talk about the deities as metaphor. Because if you have a real devotional attachment to something, you know, a deep emotional thing going on here, and somebody describes it as a metaphor, I can see that, that that might push your buttons a little bit. Yeah, okay, so you know, I can understand that. Uh, boldly rushing in where angels fear to tread, because that's kind of my paradigm, I am going to say that uh, they're both wrong, that the gods are neither metaphors nor are they literally real, and we will talk more about that as we go on. So, but here's, here's a big question that goes along with this, I think. Can we find room for that emotional excitement of devotional practice, that bhakti yoga, while still accepting the naturalistic, scientific, materialist worldview. I think we can. I think we can. Uh, but how is all that going to fit together? It's, it's, it's not trivial. It's not obvious. Uh, but first, 
a little tangent because uh, I mentioned bhakti yoga there and that reminds me of a story. I always like to throw in a little funny stories when I can here. So uh, bhakti yoga, that's the Hindu devotional practice. Uh, a lot of chanting, a lot of singing and reciting the name of God. You're just trying to keep the God, God, the gods. Is Hinduism a monotheism or polytheism? I'm going to leave that question to religious scholars uh, brighter than me. Uh, but trying to keep the name of the divine always on one's lips is a big part of, of bhakti yoga, right? Well, it seems that the story goes there was an atheist who was always going around saying, there is no God, no God, there are no gods, no God, no way, no how, no God, no such thing, no God. Well, the atheist dies. And he's immediately united with the divine. And the Godhead says, says to the atheist, you always had my name on your lips. Good job. You always had me in mind. So, sometimes it goes around on a different angle than you expect. Anyway. To talk about pagan atheism and how this might fit together, we have to we have to ask we have to do some philosophy, and there are two questions that we have to ask. Just two small, minor questions: What is a god, and what does it mean to exist? The fundamental stumpers of theology and ontology that that philosophers have been arguing about since the ancient Greeks came up with the word philosophy, and probably before that, before we had a name for it. People are arguing about this shit. So uh, we are not going to solve it once and for all here today. Uh, but the good news is there's already so much gibberish out there that I know I cannot uh, make the situation any worse. So, <laughs> so we've, uh, we've got that going for us. Okay. Um, so I think, it, I think it's useful if we imagine for a moment, if we went... Uh, Let's say we could, jump, we could jump in our TARDIS and go collect uh, a random sample of people from civilizations all the way back from ancient Sumer to today. You know, grab your, uh, your Joe Sixpack or your, uh, your Eric Meadhorn or your Alexander Shrine Jug or your, you know, your Hiroshi Saki bottle over there and uh, grab your average, your average Joe off the street and ask him a couple of questions about this stuff, right? I think what you would get is sort of a naive realism. Uh, yeah, so if I, uh, toss me a stone. <laughs> Let me have a visual aid while I, while I mention this. There we go. There we go. Okay. I was imagining talk, having a stone in my hand when I talked. Does this stone, I don't, cause I, I don't want it to be a visual stone. I want it to be, you know, a conventionally real stone. So does this stone exist? We ask our, our random person off the streets of various cultures, I guess. Of course it does, you know, what, what, that's a stupid question, right? Okay, oh, what about that, that unicorn that the town drunk said he saw behind the tavern? Does that exist? Well, unless our friend Oberon has, has been around there. He's gonna say, no, 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 that's, that's just a story, it's a fiction, you know. But, you know, uh, the, the, the part in that story about the, the mayor's daughter and the unicorn, well, that's, you know, it's not literally true, but it's kind of true, you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, it's a metaphor, right? Okay. Um, what about we ask them, is the number three real? Of course, number three real. Look, I got one, two, three coins in my pocket here, right? Yeah, of course, of course it's real, no problem, okay? What about people like you and me? Do we exist? Of course you do, I'm talking to you. What kind of, again, what kind of stupid question is that, right? So these are kind of your base reality answers to those questions. But if we're gonna be philosophers, we're gonna find that all of those points are arguable as to what exists there and what does not. And if we asked our random people about theology, you know, tell me about your God or gods or the chief, the chief God of your pantheon, you know, the big, the, big, the big cheese of your pantheon. You know, the picture that we get is basically a king. We get a king, but uh, you know, even more so. We get a king a magic king, a king who is made out of a substance that's different than our material substance, but still very much a king. In fact, in some cultures, a king could be promoted to godhood. You know, that was so it shows you that, you know, there's there's a whole line there, right? That a, a god is of the same sort of thing as uh, the kings are. Now, the idea of kings is central to the whole hierarchical social structure that evolved with civilization. Right? When we sat down 
sat down, we settled down. When we settled down to become farmers, right? Life got complicated. If you go and you grab a 15 year old boy out of a hunter gatherer tribe, he knows that tribe's whole culture. He might not be the best at making an arrowhead, but he can make an arrowhead. He might not be the best at finding medicinal herbs, but if he's got a stomach ache, he knows chew this leaf. Uh, you know, he might not be the best at tracking game or fighting the, the tribe over the hill, but he can do this stuff, okay? And he could go on uh, into a, a mystical state of consciousness. He had to go on a vision quest to become a man. Now, the guy in the tribe was best at that, or the woman, was the tribal shaman, but everybody did it. When we settle down to become agriculturalists, life gets more complicated. There's too much stuff to know. Nobody can know it all, so we all become specialists. And so uh, only the priest gets to talk to the divine now. So that's a huge change in our, our relationship with the divine. And the king, you know, before your chief, your tribal chief is just the strong guy. You know, he's the strongest guy, he has the most power. But the king is the conduit for the divine. The king is, is not just the guy who can go and, you know, kill the other people over there the way the tribal chief was. The king has a divine aspect to them. That's why, you know, it's usually the, the priests who have to do the coronation. There's this, this, always this relationship between kingship and the divine. Um, so, <clears throat> pardon me a second. So the king is central to this whole hierarchical social structure. And... You know, it kind of makes sense to just kind of project that up, that power structure up into the heavens, you know, as below, so above, right? So our God happens to look a lot like our king. Wow, hey, you know, what a, what a, what a strange coincidence that is, right? Um, you know, we know that every piece of land has to have a ruler, like somebody owns it. This is, I'm a peasant, this is my little plot, but it's mine. You know, the, the, the local feudal guy owns this plot of land, the king, owns the whole country. Well, there must be somebody even above that who the whole world is his thing, right? And that's comforting to a lot of people. Me, I'm a Zen archist. I look forward to the universal enlightenment and the abolition of the state. But a lot of people find that social structure comforting, right? You can know your place. You know your place in society. And if there is a heavenly king up there, or heavenly queen, but you know, usually we're talking about heavenly kings here, sexism, all like that, right? Then I can know my place in the universe, just as I know my place in society. God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. That, that idea that there is a, a king up there is really comforting. And um, I do think it's problematic that in our democracy, most people believe in a spiritual monarchy. Uh, I think we haven't quite uh, sanded that one out yet. And uh, we'll see how that uh, plays out over the next couple centuries, I suppose. Uh, you know, at least the Athenians had Zeus's kingship of the gods be kind of limited, right? You know, the other gods were always getting one over on him, and he wasn't, an abs wasn't quite an absolute monarch, much as he wanted to think he was. <laughs> um, the point that I want to emphasize is that there's this kind of common, sort of naive idea of deity of gods that comes from projecting our social hierarchy up into the heavens. And it's only been since that sort of civilization started to fall away with the rise of industrialism that we aren't in such a hierarchical agricultural social system anymore that atheism has been able to find any opening. So maybe we're finding that as we don't need kings here on earth, we don't need them in, in the heavens either. So we get this idea of gods and goddesses as superpowered royalty, uh, kings and queens and princes of the universe, you know, uh, a lot like us, but just made out of a more rarefied substance, not subject to the usual physical limitations. And I'm not a big fan of kings. So, you know, insofar as we were considering just that idea of deity, I will say that reason leads us to conclude that nope, those kind of gods do not exist. There are no super kings in the sky. I thumb my nose at the empty heavens, and I am not struck down by lightning. Okay. But, but, it's a little more complicated than that. Because those are not the only ideas of deity or of what it means to exist out there. Let's consider for a moment 
a subject near and dear to my own heart, me. According to Buddhism, I do not exist. And I don't mean that in the sense that, uh, you know, we're living in the matrix or you're a dreaming butterfly like Chang Su and I, like Chang Su's uh, dream. And I don't mean that, uh, oh no, actually my name is Irving Smith and I've been putting, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a conspiracy over on everyone for the past uh, uh, number of years. I mean that this thing that I label myself is just a mental construction. Uh, in Buddhism, they refer to it as, let's see, which one is which? Uh, Anna Atman is the Sanskrit, or Anatta is Pali. And my pronunciation is horrible, so if you're a, a Buddhist scholar, I apologize. Um, now this, this idea says, okay, yeah, your physical body, yeah, that exists, okay? And you have senses, you have hearing and, and sight and touch, you have a sense of time, you have emotional reactions to the world, but there's no self there. They call these the skandhas. They're just like aggregates. They're just piles of stuff. If you start digging through that pile looking for you, there's nothing there. Just like if you go into your house and you start, well, where's the house? Where's the houseness in this house? There is no houseness in this house. That houseness or the watchness of a watch or the meanness of me exists only as a relationship of the pieces and the external world. The meanness of the thing that we call by convention, Tom Swiss, exists only as a relationship of that flesh, the memories, the perception, and of the world. The Buddhists call this dependent arising, that everything arises from everything else, everything leans on everything else. I am a set of relationships that includes the food that I eat, the air I breathe, the sunlight that powers all that. It's a set of relationships that reaches out without boundaries in time and space, goes on forever. Uh, the Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh calls this interbeing. It's a, a big part of, of his teaching. And it doesn't just apply to humans, it applies to everything. It applies to the trees, the rocks, the planets, the galaxies, everything is interbeing together. None of this exists separately. It's like it's like the punchline of a Moulin Nasruddin story. Moulin Nasruddin is a, a, a trickster in the Sufi tradition. And the story is that the mullah was traveling alone across the desert one time, and another group of travelers saw him far across and said, wow, that's Moulin Nasruddin over there. We should follow him, find out where he's going, because he's a great holy man. Let's go, let's go find out what's going on over there. So they start coming towards Nasruddin. Nasruddin says, I'm out here by myself in the desert. These people are coming towards me. They must be bandits. And he starts hurrying up along his way. And the other group says, wow, he's really in a hurry. There must be something really important about to go. We better. So they follow him faster and he runs faster and they follow him faster and he runs faster. So finally, he's just, he's just exhausted. And he sits down in the middle of the desert to await his fate because he can't run anymore. And the other band of travelers comes up to him and says, oh, great, Mullah Nasruddin, we, we saw you hurrying across the desert and, you know, we, we, we had to know what, what spiritual business prompted you, you know, what, what is it that causes you to be here at this time? And Mullah Nasruddin says, well, I'm here because you're here. If my existence, if the existence of me is so conditional on the world around me, or if Mullah Nasruddin's being there at that time and that place was conditional on those other travelers and the desert and the, you know, all that, all that stuff around there, you know, what about the deities? What if, just spitballing here, okay, what if a god is a set of conditions that arise in the world? A relationship between phenomena. That's something a lot more subtle than that idea of super king. Right? And it's something that's a little bit more observer, a lot more observer dependent, a little bit harder to nail down and say yes or no. Right? And this idea of, uh, of no self, of anatta or anatma, also changes the way that we look at death. If I have never been born, if I don't exist, well, the good news is I can't die. Right? That's, 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 that's the good news behind uh, all that here. It's said that the Zen master Ban Ki lost his fear of death when he realized this, that uh, he was very scared of death as a child because his mother would, would 
punish him by pretending to be dead. Man, that's pretty abusive, I think. But uh, so he, he grew up with this fear of death. And when he was sitting in meditation and he realized, wait a minute, what is it that I'm worried about losing? There's nothing there. Or as, as uh, uh, Monty Python reminds us, you come from nothing, you go back to nothing. What have you lost? Nothing. Right? Always look on the bright side of life. Yeah. Just before you draw your terminal breath. Um, yes. You know, so, so going back to the idea of devotional practice, right? If so, I, I, I will tell you. I'm just going to get a little emotional here for uh, for a moment. Okay. Uh, I love my dad. I use the present tense. Some of you know my father passed away last fall. But yet, I do not say I loved my dad. I say I love my dad. And I do not mean that I believe that there is some sort that... Uh, no, he believed this. You know, he, was, he was not a, a pagan atheist kind of guy. He was a kind of a vaguely Unitarian Christian, I suppose. You know. um, but I do not believe that like some sort of a little ghostly uh, pilot jumped out of his brain uh, up into the heavens when he died and is up there looking at me now. Uh, if you are, sorry that I don't believe in you, but, you know, so it does. No. Um, you know, what, what, what this Buddhist teaching tells us is that there was this animate lump of carbon that we tagged with the name Mark Swiss, but that was just the center of this thing, of this set of conditions. Now the only remnant of that is the box of ashes on his desk, because uh, we haven't paid to get the family plot opened yet to, uh, to, to put him there. But all those other things are still around because nothing stops. Nothing just disappears out of the universe. You know, my father is still here in the way that I say howdy to the toll collector. In the way that the scores of kids he taught baseball root for the Orioles back home, you know. Um, he's the way I like driving through the mountains. I was thinking about that uh, on the way over here. You know, we never, we almost never went to the beach for vacation. He liked to, to get a cabin up in the mountains. I'm like, he liked, to, he, liked, he liked to just go for a, a long drive up along Skyline Drive or whatever. You know, I like this too. I never realized that. But yeah, this is a little, little bit of my dad coming out in me. All these things are still there. Dad is just a lot more spread out than he used to be. It's a little more subtle. Okay. So that's one very different idea uh, of the deities. Now another... The Ouija board. Now, if I, if, because I'm talking about deceased people and everything, you might think that I'm going to try to contact spirits and everything here with the Ouija board. But how many of you have ever messed around with the Ouija board? Yeah, I know. I figured, I figured it would be pretty. Okay, we got a couple who haven't. That's, I figured there'd be there'd be some who haven't. So, if I'm putting on my skeptical materialist scientist hat for the moment, for the moment. Okay, if I'm using a Ouija board by myself, or someone else is using a Ouija board by themselves, I can say, okay. This person has worked themselves into a disassociative state. You know, the, the some non-conscious part of their brain is moving that little guy around. It's a surprise to their conscious mind, but you know, automatic writing or moving the planchette around on the board. Okay, it's that's not hard. That's not hard to explain. When you have two people using it, though, it gets a little weirder, right? Because again, keeping on our skeptical reductionist materialist hat here for the moment. When, when communication is established with some speaker, it seems that we have to assign that speaker's physiological correlate not to one brain, to a set of neurons in one brain, as we do in the first case, but to some neurons in this brain over here and some neurons in this brain over here, not communicating through synapses and chemistry, but through nonverbal communication and, you know, who knows, through Maybe through pheromones, you know, maybe through some real subtle electromagnetic stuff. I don't know, you know, but through some nonverbal but still physically uh, manifesting means, there's some way that these two brains are creating a sort of uh, a sort of a weak group mind. Uh, let's see, how are we on time? Yeah, we got a few minutes. Do, would, would we like to try this experiment for those who have never seen this before? Could I get two volunteers who might want to come up? And give this a whirl. We're, just gonna, we're gonna ask. We're gonna ask if we can get one word. We're gonna see if we can form a temporary entity here between these two ladies. 
and ask it for one word. A word to guide our meditations here. It is This is the genuine William Fudd talking board. First created in Baltimore, hometown pride. Okay. Old school. A little old school here. Okay. All right, so you guys know how this works. You're going to place your fingers lightly on the, the, the indicator there. Okay. Might work if you have it, but if you have it symmetrically to each other there, as they demonstrate on the box how to uh, hold the latch up there. I wonder, if the, I wonder if this had any, I don't think this, I don't think the Ouija board ever came with any more instructions besides that picture, really. Yeah. Just, do this Pretty and, uh, yeah. and uh, see what kind of weirdness happens. So. He was a knock on it, but you know. <laughs> So I, I ask whatever consciousness may be present here and willing to communicate with us through, through this means, uh, if it would be willing to give us one word to guide our meditations and our revels through the next few days here at Star. And sometimes it takes that mind a little while to, to rev up. We ask for one word to guide our meditations and our revels and our work here. G. G1. It looks like one. Could be, yeah, gone, maybe, maybe. G. G1, G. <laughs> Could be or, or could be gone, G. Maybe. Goodbye. There we go. You you will have to figure out what that means for you. Uh, gone. Gone. G one G. Gone G. Gone. Ganja. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, gone. Gone is uh, is the translation of the end of the Heart Sutra. Uh, it's a wonderful translation of the the final mantra of the Heart Sutra. Gate uh, gate peragate parasam gate bodhisattva. Philip Wayland translated that as gone, gone, really gone, gone all the way over. Oh, mama. Uh, or it could just be good. 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 Yeah. Goodbye. There. Just went to the. Good, 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 good. So I, you know, so we got a communication. It was a little, uh, it was a little garbled there. But where did that come from, right? Where did that come from? If we're putting on our materialist hat, somehow these two brains made a link, right? So, and thank you, ladies. So what if? What if I could bring my notes back so I remember what I was about to say next year? Yes, um, what if we thought of that idea, but not just with two people, but with a hundred people doing a ritual together? Could that ritual act like the talking board, make a, a means of communication for that entity, that weak group mind to, to communicate with us? Okay. What sort of weak group mind might evolve in a tribe that was closely bound together for for many years okay. so there's another idea of, of deity it's very much a tribal deity there because it has it's not in you it's not in you but it's in all of us God is in all of us well yeah sort of you know okay. so there you've got two very speculative you know again I'm just spitballing here I do not propose to solve all of theology today. Give me a little more time, okay? Uh, but two speculative ideas about natures of deities that are not this kind of naive super king uh, sort of thing, okay? 
So I want to go back now and, and think about, we asked our, our random sampling of citizens from around the world cultures about what was real, okay? About um, uh, ontology. That's the, the branch of philosophy that asks, what's real, man? What's really real? That's the, that's the fundamental question of ontology. And, yeah, right, okay. So, talking about anatman and non-self, we've, kind of, we've kind of learned that when we ask, well, are you real, am I real? It's, it's more complicated than we first thought, right? So, okay, well, people are complicated. Okay, people are complicated. All right, we, we can put that aside, right? At least we can agree that numbers are real. I mean, numbers, that's the purest science, right? Yeah, that's, that's you know, that's, uh, well, there's actually uh, quite a bit of debate about that when you get into the philosophy of, of mathematics. So in philosophy in general, there are kind of two big schools. All right. There are the, the, the Platonists who take the position described to Plato that the abstractions really exist. They are really real. That in addition to like a coin being circular, there is the, the circle. There is an abstract circle which is absolutely real. It's a real thing. The perfect circle exists. It exists. It does not exist in time and space, but it exists. It is real. And then you have the nominalists, and these include some heavyweight philosophers like uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, so not, you know, not your B team. There are some, some serious philosophers uh, uh, on this one who say that what exists are the particulars. And the circle, now, that's just a convenient name. It's just a label that we give stuff so we can get shit done, okay? And there is no agreement on this after all the centuries. Another a common example of this is color. So we can agree that that's red, at least those of us who don't have color blindness and those of us who have, you know, statistically normal vision, right? We say that's red. We all agree that's red, uh, that's red, that's red, that flag over there is red. I don't have anything red. How about that? Okay. Uh, so we can, we can agree on that, more or less. Yeah, we can argue about the edge cases. Now, I'd say that's purple, right? But, you know, the general, in general, we can kind of agree on what's red. But does the color red exist as a noun? Or is redness just an adjective? And we sometimes use it as a noun for linguistic convenience, but really, it's an adjective. Mm -hmm. This is not a question for which there is an answer, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, the philosophers have been arguing about that one again since the time of the ancient Greeks. Um, and this found its way into mathematics in the 20th century. There are Platonic mathematicians who say, yes, numbers, three exists. Cir yes, circularity exists. These things are real. And others who say, no, this is, this is just a label. You know, we, we use the same label when we have three coins as when we have, uh, you know, three, uh, three bottles of beer for convenience because it's easy for us to talk about it that way, but it doesn't mean that there is something real that exists there that is the same. So if mathematicians can't agree, mathematicians of all people can't agree on whether numbers exist, I think we can have a little slack about the question of whether the gods exist, okay? All right, well, no, all right, numbers, numbers are for eggheads anyway, right? Okay, yeah, people are complicated, numbers are for eggheads. You know, let's, let's get down, let's get down to solid stuff here, right? We can all agree that stones exist, that this, you know, stones and bricks and stuff like that, that's real, right? Well, oh, some of you guys have probably heard, I'm sure, of Richard Feynman, okay, the, uh, uh, the, the physicist, yeah, okay. Um, he was, uh, uh, considered to be the greatest mind in physics after Einstein in the 20th century, all right? Um, Nobel Prize winning physicist um, and a man of, of broad curiosity, okay? He would kind of jump into a class here and there and just see how far he could get with it. He was a real rock and tour, loved to tell stories. He was into drumming. I, I can imagine him getting down with us around uh, around Paul Paul one because he hung out you know he hung out at, at Esalen he didn't believe in all that stuff but he was just like there's some pretty girls around and taking uh, you know a bath in the hot springs I'm down with this you know I don't believe in all this nonsense but hey whatever so, yeah I, I could I could I could see him coming on out to uh, Starwood you know if we had uh, a time machine if we ever get the TARDIS we're gonna grab we're gonna grab Richard Feynman and, and bring him yes. to Starwood yeah okay but uh, so one time he. This was his thing when he was a graduate student. He would just like 
go into a class and say, well, I don't know anything about this, but I'm a smart guy. Let's see how far I can get, you know, on this topic that I don't have anything, any background in. So he goes to a, a philosophy seminar where the students are talking about the idea of an essential object, which apparently is some academic philosophical term of art. I don't know what it is. Don't ask me. Feynman didn't know what it was either because he wasn't an academic philosopher. Okay. And uh, he's trying to figure out what they're talking about. And so he asks the professor, well, um, is a brick an essential object? Seems like that would be a pretty cut and dried question. And uh, uh, he wrote a story about this later and he says, what I had intended to do was to find out whether they thought that theoretical constructs were essential objects. The, the electron is a theory that we use. It is so useful in understanding the way nature works that we can almost call it real. Let me say that again. He said, we can almost call the electron real. I wanted to make the idea of a theory clear by analogy. In the case of the brick, my next question was going to be, what about the inside of the brick? And I would then point out that no one has ever seen the inside of a brick. Every time you break the brick, you only see the surface. That the brick has an inside is a simple theory which helps us understand things better. The theory of electrons is analogous. So I began by asking, is a brick an essential object? Now here we have a Nobel Prize winning physicist, one of the greats, saying that we can, yeah, we can almost but not quite call electrons real. And saying the same thing about the inside of a brick. According to Feynman, both are theoretical constructs which should not be confused with real reality. And the philosophy students, as in all good stories about philosophers, were unable to agree on whether a brick was an essential object. So, so again, if, if we can't agree that bricks and stones and electrons are entirely real, how can we make firm statements about the gods? So I think, I will now tell you what I think about these great puzzles, because that's why you have come here, right? I think the answer to this, what we need, is a sort of contextualism. When we ask these questions, we have to ask, well, in, in what context does this thing exist, right? And there is apparently a fancy philosophical name for this. I was so sad to learn I had not discovered this concept uh, all, by my, all by my lonesome for the first time. Uh, ontological anti-realism. There's a good explanation of that. We're going we're gonna to explain exactly what that is, but we've we got to give you some terms first. I think this is a really good idea, but we need to, we need to hold tight for a little bit of, of philosophical uh, lingo here. So ontology, right? Ontology is the branch of philosophy where we ask what's real, okay? And so uh, uh, a meta-ontologist is someone who gets meta about ontology and asks, well, what, what system of ontology should we use? Okay, so ontology philosophy of what's real. Meta-ontology, philosophy of asking what type of philosophy of what's real should we use. And I suppose we could get meta about that and meta about that and infinite regress as we always could, but let's not do that right now. Okay. Uh, Mariology, uh, this is another word I'm going to pronounce hideously. Mariology is the branch of ontology which deals with relationships between parts and wholes. So when we ask, we, I take two things and I stick them together. Have I made a new thing? Or do I just have two things stuck together? That's, that's the big question there. So a mariological sum means when you take two things and you glom them together and you get a new thing. Okay? So you have mariological universalists who, uh, who say if you take any two things and put them together, you really have a new thing. You have a new thing has come into existence. And then you have nihilists, nihilists who say, no, only the basic building blocks exist. You can glom them together as much as you want, but all that really exists are those basic building blocks. Okay. And we talked a minute ago about Platon, uh, uh, Platonists and nominalists. Platonists believe that those abstracts are really real, that red exists, that circularity exists. Nominalists say, no, no, no. They're just names for, for our observed phenomena. Okay, so with that, we can handle the explanation of uh, ontological anti-realism that the philosopher David Chalmers gives us. For example, the ontologist, the guy who studies existence, may ask, do numbers exist? The Platonist says yes. The nominalist says no. 
The meta-ontologist may ask, is there an obvious fact of the matter whether numbers exist? The ontological realist says yes. The, onto the ontological anti-realist says no. Likewise, the ontologist may ask, given two distinct entities, when does the mariological sum of those two entities exist? In other words, when we glom two things together, do they really make a new thing? The universalist says always, always. The nihilist says never. The meta-ontologist may ask, is there an objective fact of the matter about whether the sum of two distinct entities exists? The ontological realist says yes. The ontological anti-realist says no. Ontological anti-realism is often traced to a dude named Carnap. Uh, Chalmers did not say a dude named, but yes. Ontological anti-realism is often traced to Carnap, who held that there are many different ontological frameworks holding that different sorts of entities exist, and that while some frameworks may be more useful than others for some purposes, there is no fact of the matter as to which is correct. Let me say that again. Some frameworks about what's real may be more useful than others for some purposes, but there is no fact of the matter as to which one is right. Is that making a pragmatist? One might, uh, that, I, I would say that's kind of a pragmatic attitude. I, I don't think that you could get into a whole history of philosophy thing and whether that counts as philosophical pragmatism or not. That's, yeah. that's, beyond, my, uh, that's beyond my pay grade. But. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, another, another quick tangent, because you do kind of hear that, well, you know, there's no actual fact of the matter about what exists from, from sort of the, the postmodern and uh, critical theory folks out there. But what gets lost in that is that once you have a specific purpose, like getting useful shit done in the world, you know, you can say that some frameworks are more useful than others, okay? So it's not like, well, you know, Newtonian gravitation, man, that's just a, uh, that's just a, a white imperialist... Uh, you know, uh, imposing their view on the world. It, it, no, it's actually, once you decide that you want to get shit done, like send a satellite into orbit, it's really useful. You know, we could say it's not more real than other frameworks when we're sitting around here drinking beer in this context. But, you know, when you're trying to do some engineering, when you're trying to do some rocket scientist, some rocket science, uh, Newtonian physics works pretty darn well. Even if we know it's not 100% in some other context, right? Okay. So we need, perhaps, to, to deal with the gods, maybe what we need are several different ontological frameworks, or as our friend Robert Anton Wilson liked to call them, reality tunnels. Okay. When we ask, do the gods exist? We have to ask, in what framework? In what context? Within a ritual, I would say, the gods invoked exist. Not as metaphors, but in the same way that Hamlet exists when you're doing the play. If your Hamlet is a metaphor, your play is going to suck. Your Hamlet has to be real from the time the curtain goes up till the audience leaves, at the very least. Okay. And probably for longer stretches than that. But if, you know, if you're, I'm working on a physics or engineering problem, or trying to understand a biological process, I'm not really that involved in what the gods uh, uh, have to say about it. Okay. Uh, the gods do not exist when I make my personal budget. As much as I could use a miracle to help with the finances, so please buy a book. Um, you know, but when I sit down to try to figure out how can I lead a life of prosperity and usefulness, eh, I might want a little divine guidance on that question. Okay. Uh, if I'm doing healing work and the person wants me to pray for them, Whatever their gods are, they, they exist quite, quite, uh, they're quite real for the duration of that work. You know, I don't care, you're, you're, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Hindu, you're, you're a pagan, uh, whatever. You know, I will, I will do my best to make your God real to me while I'm doing that work. Um, uh, as uh, uh, Neil Gaiman's Morpheus, Sandman, once said, uh, I am of all faiths after my fashion. And I will, I will steal that idea uh, as necessary. Well, on the other hand, you know, a couple of years ago, and some of you know this story, uh, I found myself doing CPR on someone, a, a friend of mine. And it was a very intense moment, and I was very aware of the energetics, you know, the, 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 the mythic reality that I was blowing air, I was being the breath of life for this person. 
But I was not worried about the gods at that moment. I was, it was all about reductionist biomedicine and we're going to pump on this chest and we're going to move air around and that was the thing on my mind. But a couple days later, uh, and he is fine now, he is a, a, a walking medical miracle. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Telesma, they played here before. This is Ian Hesford from Telesma who was dead for an hour and a half and came back. He is our favorite zombie and uh, he is in better shape than I am now. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a story. The, the man literally died on stage. Um, and came back. But a couple days after that, I was, yeah, right right after all that went down, I was headed for Japan. He was still in a coma when I left the country. And uh, when I was in Japan, there is a, a temple in Nara. Uh, Nara is Nara is a 3,000 year old city uh, outside Kyoto. It's one of my favorite places in the universe. And there is a temple there to the healing Buddha. Uh, it is called the New Temple of the Healing Buddha because it was built in the year 700-something. Not 1700-something, the year 700-something, as opposed to the other Temple of the Healing Buddha that's about 100 years older. Um, and I went to that temple the first time I was in Japan, shortly before I went to study Shiatsu and uh, acupressure and stuff. So it's always been a very meaningful place to me. And I went there because, you know, not because I thought that the Healing Buddha, that Ikushi was like a, a super god who could reach down from the heavens and and you know help my friend, but because it seemed like it seemed like the most beautiful thing I could do in that moment. It seemed like the best thing I could do, and doing that would change my mind a little bit. Going to this place and and meditating on the healing Buddha and the twelve warrior healers uh, whose figures are there uh, would would change my mind a little bit, and then telling people about that experience would change their minds and send ripples uh, out into the world. This is the subtle way that magic works to change the world. We change our minds, we change our behavior, and that echoes around and changes other people's minds. And it's natural. Our brains are wired for it. To take that, that subtle flow of uh, an intention and attention and energy it's a natural thing for us to take that very subtle flow all around us and put human faces on it. Because our, our brains are wired to see humans. A man in the moon, you know? You, you put two dots in a line and we see a face, man. You know, our brains are wired for that. So it's natural for us to see faces in that flow of, uh, that flow of magic. And that flow is real. That flow is, it's more subtle than stones or unicorns or numbers, but it exists as more than just metaphor. So I believe, to, to summarize uh, uh, here, uh, I believe that if we give up trying to find one ultimate final truth that embraces uh, everything in human experience, if we can just, then we can justify and we can rightly hold multiple views. And from that we can get a sort of depth perception. I'm a pagan and an atheist. And there's no more conflict between that than between my left eye and my right eye. And it gives me a deeper perception of the world. Another question. You ever, yes. Um, yeah, chaos magic. Chaos same, magic. Same principle. You know, you actually use the practical or constructive yeah. belief for that moment to work your ritual. Mm -hmm. you know, and, you, and it doesn't matter if you believe it five minutes ago or not. You know, you just you adopt it and you adopt it fully. Yeah. Yeah, we had a, a, a really nice talk about that uh, uh, here was it yesterday, the day before. The days yeah. all blend together. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, we did a little sigil work and uh, yeah. let's go. Yeah, that's yeah. So th uh, thank you for hanging out. We still have about you know, 15, 20 minutes, but if we want to hang out, we can just turn it into uh, a discussion here. But uh, thank you for letting me ramble on about uh, uh, all this stuff uh, for a while. And if you're like, that one thing is really interesting. I'd like to track down the, the reference on that. As it, the book, which is fully footnoted, is uh, up there at the Ace Tent. Or you can actually find a free ebook version, a Creative Commons version of What Does It Mean for the Gods to Exist and other essays uh, on my website, uh, infamous.net. Um, so yes, free books. I got esoteric knowledge here and I'm giving it away in the words of, uh, of the great Billy Bardo. So thank you. And they're serving, I think, now. So. Are you happy hour yet? 5.30. <laughs> Or we just get the Ouija board and put There we go, yeah, yeah. If you wanna Yeah. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask a question of the mystifying oracle, feel free.
In fact, maybe we should leave this down here. For the, maybe we should leave oh, this down here. Yeah. 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 Why not? You know, <laughs> Harwood, right? <laughs> 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 invite chaos. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Where's my golden apple? First, we must ask, what is the question? What is the question? Yes, yes, okay, yes, 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 yes. Yes, perhaps that's a question we should ask the board. What is the question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Y'all have to think up questions for Ask Hal for Hal, so that would be a great question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Ask Hal, what is the question? So have you ever met anyone who identifies as Asperger's? Yeah. 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 What you would call a devotional college is practice, like a regular devotional black practice. I don't think I have. I don't think I have. I'm glad you're representing this. This is definitely a question that has been ranked in my mind a lot. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I know that yes, part of what John Halstead has talked about is trying to make room for that emotional excitement you know he's certainly not a devotional polytheist and uh but he's uh he's pointed out the need for to make space for that well i know i took but some, the emotional um, side of it yeah uh courses uh via the internet basically with um csbl and i know that john Holton has had a friendly uh Challenge and uh, okay, rivalry. Uh, rivalry uh, with with uh, PSPL. With uh, with. Um, with, uh, with, with uh, Peace, Pain, Furious, Lupus. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Seen, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Metagendered. Yeah. Yes. Who, yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen some. I've seen some yeah. back and forth. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, you know, I, I'm like I consider myself a devotional apologist who, on a given day, may not believe anything. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Like, but I just keep the practice. Yeah, yeah. The practice works. Yeah, I mean, if it's a practice, you don't have to. Dogma and practice do not necessarily have to go together. You know, one of the one of the most interesting experiences that I've had in in trying to learn about religion was I was very fortunate when I was in Japan that I I met a Shinto priest who had gone to law school here in the U.S. So English was flawless. And he invited me to come watch him teach acolytes. He was teaching them a ritual. Now he was speaking Japanese. I don't speak Japanese uh, beyond beyond where's the bathroom. Uh, you know, I, I I do not speak Japanese. Um, but it was I, I could still get a sense of what he was doing, which is he was teaching the ritual, the mechanics of the ritual. You pick up this implement and you move it like this, and you move to this side of the altar, and you you do this and. There was no dogma involved. You don't. You don't have to believe. There, I mean, there is no creed of Shinto, as with most of the the ancient uh, polytheisms, pantheisms. What label do we want to put on them? Again, uh, uh, we can argue uh, about that. But those traditional practices usually are so much more about what do you do than what do you believe, because nobody wrote it down. There's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there, some holy books maybe came later, but certainly back in the beginning, there was no, we believe, you know, we're going we're to do our creed now, you know, we believe in uh, uh, 17 gods, uh, of whom the chief is so-and-so, and we believe that at death so-and-so happens, and we believe that blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, we, we have this harvest festival, and at the harvest festival we do this, and we have the funeral rites, and at the funeral rites we do this. And because a, a lot of it is about social cohesion, sure. it's getting back to that that idea of we built this complicated mess of of hierarchical agricultural civilization, and to keep it running, we got a climate. We got to get people okay with being in their place, and so we have to have a lot you know, a big part of of ritual in civilized societies is making people comfortable with being a cog in the machine, if I'm going to put it a little bit cynically. Um, or making them comfortable with their place in society, if you know, we want to put it a little more optimistically. Depends on how, depends on how ex uh, exploitive your society is, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it was... Uh, 
So some 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 of this stuff comes out of Joseph Campbell, and there's a uh, an essay of his, "The Symbol Without Meaning," which was uh, a, a big influence on on my thinking because he talks about that's where this whole idea of hunter gatherer culture versus civilized culture and the the shaman versus the priest, the generalist versus the specialist. Everybody gets to have the mystical experience versus no, no, no. You, I'm the priest. You got to go through me. Only I talk to the divine. Yeah. And it's it's uh, Campbell's contention that that's falling apart now. This uh, the mandala is falling apart. We are now getting into a phase in human existence where we need to get back to that direct experience of the divine. Of, of there you go. I like that. Yes, yes, yes. No, no long, no, no more. Just, just uh, you know, only the priests get to do it. We all get to talk to the divine. And if everybody's talking to the divine, though, people are going to start hearing different things. That's that. That can make for chaos, right? I'm, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the subway in Manhattan a couple of years ago, and this, this, this street corner preacher comes in. This woman comes in, and she's going off, and she's going off about homosexuality. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And there, there's a, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to assume, but I'm, I'm, I, I will put, you know, good odds down that the, the two ladies behind me were a lesbian couple because they are really getting uh, uh, upset about this. And so I turn and I put on my, I put on my preacher voice. I say, lady, you heard God wrong. <laughs> I did shut her up. And, uh, you know, and she and her husband just cast daggers on me with their eyes. And, you know, who knows what, uh, what cursing they were, they were putting on me there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if, we, if we're all allowed to, to have revelation, if we're all allowed to start talking to the divine, somebody's going to come back. And, and, you know, when, when the, the guy in power says, well, God told me, but one of us uh, 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 ne'er-do-wells is going to stand up and say, I think you heard God wrong. And oh, all kinds of chaos and and whatnot's gonna gonna roll out of that. So. Oh God, yes. I I I used to do a performance piece back in the days of phone books when the yellow pages was a thing. I would do a performance piece where I would take the yellow pages. You can only do this in a good sized city. I don't think you could do this with like the Athens phone book. You know, we could do it with the Baltimore Yellow Pages. I would flip to the heading under churches, and I would just read the headings. You know, churches, churches, Anglican, churches, Anglican, Reformed, churches, Anglican, Reformed, Second Reformation. You know, all the different. You know, there was a commentary on man's search for the divine and meaning. Uh, you know, we get because it would get funny. The churches, Baptist, churches, Baptist, Southern. Churches, Baptist, Southern, Missouri Synod. Churches, Baptist, Southern, Missouri Synod, Reformed. You know, it would get down to the these. Protestant movement, you know, was to get back to that, you know, back to the experience. Yes. Much closer because the Catholic Church had so many you right. know, uh, layers between you and God. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. the, the Protestant the Reformation. But I, I feel like I've got to jump in here and have it. Somebody who was raised in the Church of Missouri. Okay, okay. Um, but I see a lot of that in devotional polytheism. Mm. I see the personal Morgan, the yeah. personal this, um, and and I'm being I was called. Oh yeah, that, yeah. Know, I was called. So you right. must be lying. You heard right. God wrong. Right. Only I heard God properly. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Even even to the point of like God marriages or things yeah. like that. And, yeah. Yeah. and I I can't participate in that relationship because of how alienating the mm -hmm. being raised yes yeah it, 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 some of that does strike me as that that same uh with, with Jesus. yeah it, it, it's great so to have I, a personal I, I love like Gaulish deities you can't possibly know anything about yeah. them from the Lord there's nothing <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Lord, so, um, but, um, my personal practice is definitely yeah more yeah if you're if you're you're trying to wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute there uh, uh devotional politics you're trying to put limits on deities and say that only you know uh you know i'm not quite sure about that i think you've made a serious error <laughs> Guess what, you, you mentioned the, the Morgan. It was interesting. I had an experience at Free Spirit Gathering last year. So there's a group there. They, they do uh, uh, possession working, uh, Universal Temple of Spirits. It's really cool. Uh, they, they, their, their work, it comes out of like the Afro-Caribbean tradition, but it's very open. So, you know, they will 
invite in deities of many, many, many different pantheons, and they just get they just get the drumming going, and we're all dancing around, and you know, I've, I've never. Yeah, possession isn't something that I, I don't think I don't I don't think I'm ever going to get ridden by a deity like that. I don't think I'm wired that way. But I, I can still have a conversation, shall we say? You know, and I had this at at the ritual last year. Um, so in the middle, I'm, I'm continuing to circumambulate the circle. But it kind of in the middle, someone is having a possession going on, and they're they are having the Morrigan. And their Morrigan that they are channeling is having a whole political thing about we need, you know, the, the feminine now in this moment of Trump and, and all like this. And but, but that I was I would say that I was having a whole different facet of the Morrigan at that moment because um, uh, I had my my mother had just recovered from going that close to death. And I, I said many times, and I'll say it now, it's like there and there are there are Celtic warrior queens in that woman's ancestry, man, because she is just tough. I mean, she's not a fighter, but she's a fighter, you know. Um, she she lost three feet of intestine. She was septic. She went into uh, a liver failure, kidney failure, had a heart attack. She was on a respirator. She was given a 10% chance of survival. They gave her the Lutheran last rites before she went in for surgery. Uh, for someone who uh, uh, lost, she, she's fine. I mean, other than a huge scar, and uh, you know, losing three feet of intestine, it does kind of mess with your digestive system. She's going back to work, you know. Um, uh, but the first, when she came back to herself, because for a while there was just nobody home, you know. But when she came back to herself, one of the first things she said was, "She told my dad, bring me my weights, just like little one-pound dumbbells, because she lost." 30 pounds of, of, of fat and muscle and, and she was skin and bones and she knew like I'm going to have to work to get myself back and you know the, the rehab center said they never saw anyone come in as bad shape as she was and get out as quickly as she did um, so yeah I'm having, I'm having this whole moment and I realize that's the Morgan energy man the warrior queen and oh hey I've been the student of a female sensei uh, you know for, for 20 years now and I teach women how to fight Oh yeah, the more oh that's that that's that uh, that thing I've been feeling over my shoulder. That's the Morrigan. I'm having this whole thing with, but it's a completely different facet of the Morrigan than was appearing in that possession right there. And I feel as that that type of work is very open to that. You know, nobody says, "Well, no, you didn't." What do you mean? You didn't talk to them. Only I talked to the Morrigan. I, I see the Morrigan. My daughter died from an overdose after being. <laughs> Um, sober for seven months, she re relapsed, and I, she fell in battle. As far as I'm concerned, she yeah. she was a warrioress, and she went down in battle with a very, very fierce foe. And so. you know, the, the Morgan is swept her up and yeah, and yeah. I, you know, I see yeah. her sweeping her up and taking her. Yeah. Yeah. The conscious is being created by stories. Yeah, absolutely, story, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the, the brain is a storytelling machine, yeah. man. So yeah. it's such a powerful storytelling machine. It made me. Right? I got all this stuff going on and my brain makes this 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 thing out of it and I call it me. It's a character. Right. Well and then it becomes